Not every video on the internet is real and the fake ones are multiplying. That's thanks to the spread of deep fakes. Deep fakes are videos that have been altered using machine learning, a form of artificial intelligence, to show someone saying or doing something that they did not in fact do or say. The results can be great fun. Take, for example, these hilarious clips of Nicolas Cage starring in movies that he was never in. But deepfakes can also be a tool for harassment and a way to spread political misinformation. To learn more about the deepfakes era we live in, I spoke with Sam Gregory, who tracks these videos at the human rights nonprofit Witness. What is a deepfake and, and where did they come from? Why are we talking about them all of a sudden? What deepfakes are are the next generation of video and audio manipulation and sometimes images. They're based on artificial intelligence and they make it much easier to do a range of things. So what people think of as a deep fake is typically the face swap, right? You take the face of one person and you transfer it onto another person. But we might also think within the same category of other forms of synthetic media manipulation, like the ability to manipulate someone's lips and perhaps sync them up with a fake or real audio track, or the ability to make someone's body move uh, or appear to move in a way that is realistic but is in fact computer generated. And all of this is driven by advances in artificial intelligence, particularly the use of what are known as generative adversarial networks. And in these adversarial networks, they have the capacity to set two artificial intelligence networks competing against each other, one producing forgeries, the other competing to detect the forgeries. And as the forgeries improve, they do it based on this competition between two networks. So this is one of the big challenges underlying deepfakes is that often they are improving because of the nature of the inputs. There are so many different ways you could, you could use that technology. What are we seeing out there in the wild? At the moment, they're primarily non-consensual sexual images. Probably up to 95% of the deepfakes out there are images of celebrities or they're non-consensual images of ordinary people being shared on porn sites or being shared in closed messaging. We have started to see some other cases of deepfakes being used in other contexts, targeting women journalists or civic activists with uh, images that appear to show them in, in, in sexual situations. We've also started to hear people using the it's a deep fake excuse. So in the small number of political level cases where there was potentially a deep fake, you see people weaponizing the phrase it's a deep fake. And almost in that case, it's really a version of the same phrase. It's fake news. And Sam, tell us how easy this technology has become to access. You mentioned that, that it's improved. Can anyone do this? It's still not at the point that anyone can do a, a really convincing face swap deepfake. There's code available online. There are uh, websites you can go to that will allow you to create a deepfake. You know, some of those deepfakes will be imperfect, but we also know that imperfect deepfakes can still cause harm. So it's getting more accessible because it's getting commercialized, commoditized. And what's become clear in the last six months is that deepfakes and also other synthetic media like audio generation is getting better and better and requiring less training data, less, uh, less examples you need to generate the data, all of which mean we're going to get more and more of this content, and it's probably going to be a bit of better and better quality. In Congress, there has been concern about deepfakes being used to distort political campaigns, maybe even the 2020 presidential campaign. Right, there's clearly vulnerabilities for political candidates for the, you know, the last minute surprise of the compromising video. A lot of attention goes to political candidates. There are detection methods being developed for those political candidates to protect them from deepfakes. And the reason people worry about the advances in deepfakes and in other synthetic media is we've really seen quite significant progress in the last six to 12 months. We've seen, you know, a decline in the amount of training data needed down to you know, a few images for some of the face expression modification. We've seen people starting to combine video manipulation like the lips with simulation of audio. And we're starting to see the commercialization of this into apps. And as things go to mobile, that increases them. As they become apps, they obviously get much more available. And this is why it puts the pressure to be saying, how are we making sure that as these get more available, they're detectable? And that app makers also think about detection at the same time as they think about creation because you have a Pandora's box there and we've already seen how a Pandora's box like that can be unleashed. What possible solutions are, are people talking about? You, you mentioned the idea of a technical solution. I, I guess, you know, the ideal thing would be something like a spam filter. Spam filtering is pretty good these days. You don't see much spam. Could, could we do that for deepfakes? Just block them out. We could, but we'd have to define what we think is a malicious deepfake, right? Because, you know, deepfakes and all this genre of synthetic media are really you know, they're, they're related to computational photography, doing a funny face filter on, a, on an app. Now you might say, that's fun, that's my granny. Or you might say, that's 
great. You know, I think it's great that that's a satire of my president. Or you might look and say, I want to check this against another source. What we're not doing actually at the moment is telling people how to detect deep fakes with technical clues. And the reason for that is each of those glitches is the current algorithmic kind of Achilles heel, right? It's the problem of the current version of the algorithm. But as we put different data into the algorithm, as we recognize that's a problem, it's not going to do that. So for example, a year ago, people thought that deep fakes didn't really blink. And now you see deep fakes that blink. Now there are technical solutions. They are all going to be partial solutions and we should want them to be partial solutions. There's a lot of investment in detection using advanced forms of media forensics. The problem with all those approaches is that they always are at a disadvantage. The attacker has the advantage there with the new technique and can learn from the previous generations of creation and forgery and forgery detection. Substituting a kind of technical check, check mark for human reasoning is not a great idea, both because systems like that get broken. They're an absolute honeypot for hackers and people who want to disrupt it. And also because these things are complex, right? You know, it, it, you know, something may look real and that may not matter to us that it has had some manipulation and you don't want to give that across. And something may have a tick mark, but in fact, the context is all wrong. I tend to think of detection as being the thing that at least gives us some signals, some signals that might help us say, actually, there's something suspicious here. I'm going to need to use my media literacy. I'm going to have to think about it. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned, you know, the, the question of how people should think differently now that we're in the, the deep fake era, you might call it. I guess it was never a good idea to believe everything you saw on the Internet. And now you, you can't believe anything you see. Like, what's the right what's the right mindset to have? I think it's also a problem generally with the misinformation, disinformation discussion is we've convinced people they can't believe anything online when the reality is much of what's shared online is true or true enough. It, it does increase the pressure on us to recognize that photos and text are not necessarily trustworthy. We need to use our media literacy on them to assess where it came from, is there corroboration. And what's complicated about video and audio is we have a different cognitive reaction. We don't have the filters we've either built or cognitively have around text and photo. So I think a real onus on both platforms who have the capacity to be looking for this, but also people who build the tools that are starting to create this to feel a responsibility to, yes, build great tools for creation, but also to build tools for detection. And then we can plug that into a culture that where we're really saying you do need media literacy, you do need to look at content and assess it. And I don't think that's the same as saying it's the end of truth. I think it's saying, you know, we have to be skeptical viewers. How do we give them technical signals? How do we build? the media literacies that will deal with this latest generation of manipulation. Well, Sam, thank you very much for your uh, help understanding deepfakes. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the interview.